Welcome everybody to Congregation Lador Vador's Touch of Torah. Tonight we have as our special guest, Rabbi Lauren J. Frank. Rabbi Barry is not able to be with us. He's on a, a debate panel with, about abortion rights. So we are so fortunate to have Rabbi Loring Frank with us this evening. We're going to be talking about the Parsha of the Torah with this upcoming Shabbat. It's Numbers Chukat. So with that, I'm turning it over to Rabbi Frank. Oh, good. I'm glad you said Rabbi Frank. You said Rabbi Barry, because sometimes when people have two or three names, they get confused. I want to keep it like, like Madonna, you know, like <laughs> Rabbi Frank. Okay. Shalom, everyone. What a wonderful honor to be with you this evening. I spoke to Rabbi Barry. He called me just a, literally a few moments ago. To, he said to me, Loring, my first name, Loring, can you do the Zoom? And I said, yes. So here we are. So I'm really honored to be with everyone. And uh, Barry gave me a little take on the um, Torah reading as he saw it. And he spoke about, of course, the, the cow and, and so on. And, and the, the, part of the beginnings of uh, kosher and so on and so forth. But I have a different take of the Torah reading today. But first, before we even get into it, does anyone have any idea? Uh, I'm, not, I'm sure you do, what a Torah reading is about and what it meant to you. Maybe we we'll just get a couple inferences uh, from different people as to what this Torah meant to you, this Torah reading Hukat. It means the laws. Did anyone get a chance to look over that first? I want to hear from you first. Anyone? Yes. Were you saying something, Sharon? I, I will, but I thought I saw another hand. Alan, did yes. you have your hand raised? No. Okay. So um, this Parsha, to me, Chukat is important because um, Moses, uh, the, the people are, again, they're kvetching because they don't have any enough to drink and eat, and, and they keep kvetching to Moses and... God instructs Moses that he should touch the rock and bring forth water from the rock, but they're fetching so much. And rabbis just, Moses has just had it just up to here. And instead of touching the rock, he, he hits the rock. The rock, of course, brings forth water. But for this, for this sin, quote unquote, Moses is not allowed to enter the new land of Israel. So to me, it's, a, it's an important message, but to listen when somebody tells you what to do, maybe you should listen with your eyes and ears open at all times. So That's a good point. And now let me ask you, you said earlier it was a typical time for Moses. Now at this time of his life, he's getting older. He, he might not be able to go into the, land that, uh, that they've all been striving for many years, 40 years throughout the desert. And he's uh, also the loss of his sister and his brother and being old. I mean, you know, he's, he's been, he's like famished, right? So it's almost like if something doesn't work exactly, and I'm, I'm 72, I'm getting to that point a little bit, I have a little less patience. Uh, if something happened to, uh, to Moses that he did a little extra you know, aggravated uh, way of hitting the rock or touching the rock. Um, I, I feel for him and I understand that. So uh, that might not be the only part of the Torah reading that uh, that is important to, to everyone else. But to me, that's a little special uh, place in my heart because uh, our patients are being tried with what's going on in politics, what's going on in society. And, and people in the COVID and people are saying, you know, gosh, you know, everyone's at each other's throats and they're this. And so I have a feeling that Moses was experiencing something similar to that. So I, I feel for him. And I, I want to just turn it over to our congregation as to how you feel about that part. Of course, the, let me just share with you before I go into any more, some of the details of the Torah reading. Should I share it with you coming from uh, yes. an essay of rabbis? Of course, Hukat means laws. The Sidra, the Torah reading, tells of the death of Miriam and Aaron. These are Moses' brother and sister. It's a sad time in Moses' life. For Israel's great leader. This was a period which the wilderness generation was quickly passing. All the older, you know, ancestors were dying off. And there's a younger generation making way for the younger generation who were to be given the opportunity to enter into the promised land. Would Moses be privileged to enter Canaan, which is, of course, now Israel? It was a question to which Moses would now receive an answer. Israel was now at the end of the wanderings of nearly 40 years. They were now in the Dead Sea area. How many of us have been to the Dead Sea area? It's a pretty uh, 
challenging area, Dead Sea area. Again, a problem arose where uh, people were upset. There was not enough drinking water. And the people were complaining to Moses, like you said, kvetching. By now, Moses was an aged and tired man. He was, how was he to get water for the people, being that he's an aged man? And uh, being that he was tired and aged, how was he to get the water? He was deeply troubled for this. And he prayed to God for guidance. Moses was instructed to take his rod and with his brother Aaron, speak to the rock, which God chose for him. The rock would give forth water. Speak to the rock. In his impatience, Moses struck the rock twice. And when the water spurted out, it was as if in response to the rod rather than God's determination. God was displeased with Moses' be behavior because he said that he failed to show his complete faith, which Moses always showed everyone, complete faith in God before the children of Israel, he would not lead the people into the land. Another man would succeed him as leader in the promised land. That would be, of course, be Joshua. But so that is an overview of how I take it. Nothing about the, the cow. Or it says in the first part of our Torah reading uh, that for those of us who read the Torah in Hebrew, of course, like Moses, like, uh, Moses, like Barry, and the Lord spoke to Moses, to Aaron, saying, and this is the ritual law that the Lord has commanded. Instruct the Israelite people to bring forth a red cow without blemish, in which there is no defect, on which no yoke has been laid, so on and so forth. So that is a minor part of it, but maybe to others it's a very important part. I think what we just read a minute ago uh, about the overview from the rabbis is the most important about how Moses felt as a great leader. So let's turn this over to all of us now and see. Let me ask you a question also while we're on this subject about the different aspects of politics and the COVID and the aggravation that we're facing with inflation and so on and so forth. Uh, how do you all feel now? I mean, how are you? Are you feeling a little at edge? Do you have a little sympathy for Moses now that uh, we know that why Moses maybe struck the right the rock to begin with, maybe once or twice or maybe more or less, but he struck the rock. Is do you feel a little impatient with uh, what's going on right now in society about a lot of issues with laws and so on? I'm going to turn it back over to our congregation. How do you feel about that? Dr. Brooks, go ahead. I'll unmute you. You have your hand raised. Oh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think we're all, you know, after COVID and uh, we here are having the, the, our second or third week without any rain. It's 102 degrees outside. Uh, the grass crunches as you walk. Uh, I think we've all kind of felt that. But, you know, I, I didn't think about it until I heard Rabbi Reed. But I, I'm, I'm not buying, I'm not buying it. I'm looking this at, I'm looking back at this more as an explanation for why Moses died before he got to the promised land. I just don't see the God that I serve saying, well, you know, you did all that stuff and there's no indication, you know, faith is not a big part of the Jewish religion. I mean, you know, that, that sounds more like our Christian brethren that you got to believe, you got to believe, you got to believe, you know, there's very little in the Bible that tells us what we're even supposed to think. You know, the closest is not to covet. Other than that, loving God, you know, there's no commandments on any of that. So I just wonder if it's not a, you know, I, I always feel like sometimes the Bible misbehaves uh, and sometimes it tries to explain things, you know, it explains the rainbow, et cetera, uh, whether this is an explanation why Moses didn't make it, because I see it a little capricious on God's part. Okay. Dr. Brooks, where are you? You're at, you're in Texas, I think. Arkansas. Arkansas. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We had, uh, we had three weeks of constant rain and uh, we said, please stop raining. Um, and you always have to be careful what you wish for. <laughs> so now you have three weeks with no rain. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think the Jewish people have a lot of faith. I mean, they have, they have to have faith that there is a God from the very beginning, you know, it, there was a mention of God from the very beginning. There must have been faith at the very beginning to know that there's a creator. Uh, so uh, even though they didn't see physically uh, what God looked like, they saw God's creation. So I think that they had a lot of faith that they know that there was a, uh, a greater spirit uh, that would create all that. But that just saying, I, I don't know of any Jewish person ever 
being told they don't have faith, you know, so I don't know. I, I think no, it's no, really no. important. No, and I don't think that's not how I meant it. I, I agree with you. Oh, I'm just okay. saying that I don't think faith is some is a big part of what God requires of us. And I don't see it. Um, I mean, because otherwise it's the same thing as a Christian idea. If you don't believe you go to hell, you know, if you don't believe you, you don't go to the promised land. I, I just think that's uh, it's a little outside of my belief wheel. I understand. Okay. Does anyone else have any comments about the uh, Torah reading? And maybe we can speak about other aspects that's going on in society now, too, to, to kind of tie into how Moses might have felt. I know I've seen a lot of people on edge, as you described, Pastor. Uh, so uh, anybody else have any comments about Moses' action or about uh, why or how, your actions, for example? Anything in particular? How many, by the way, I didn't know if I saw it. Let me see if I can turn this. In. Emmett, I want to see if there's other people on. How many people are on, Sharon? We have seven total, including oh, yourself. Oh, okay, then I probably see it. I just didn't see the pastor speaking. Yeah. I didn't see. Uh, are you sitting down, Pastor? Oh, maybe not. Okay. So anybody else have any thoughts? Let's, I'd love to hear you. Yes, please. Edward or Gloria or Harris. Want to share anything about it? No? Okay. Harris, you want to say something? Go ahead. Yeah, please. I got you unmuted. Oh. A very negative thought that nobody's going to like. Am I muted? Can you hear me? No, I can hear oh, you. We Go can ahead. Hear you. We can repeat, hear you. repeat it again, Harris. I have a very negative thought that I don't know if I should say it or not. Of course, say it. Well, as you know, Moses was Egyptian. Right? Well, he was raised in Egypt, but he he was from a Israelite, if you will, or Canaanite. Uh, well, from what background. I understand, Moses was Egyptian, and in Egyptian history, they have no mention of Moses at all. Oh, okay. But That's I don't think negative. I don't think you would say Moses was in a you know Moses was me like I'm an American, but my ancestry from you know European or whatever. Who knows? Maybe. Israeli descent from the centuries below that, you know, so. Okay, interesting that you say that. Okay. Well, well it was also... They have idol, the idol worshiping with the Egyptians, right? Well, it also had another note, not to be sarcastic, but Jesus Christ never existed either in the same uh, paragraph. Okay. Well, I have this firm belief that Jesus was Jewish and his Brit Mila was on January the 1st, being he was born January, uh, December 25th. So that's proof for me that he had a Brit Mila. And back in those days, uh, the only people having Brit Mila circumcision were the um, Israelites. Yeah. yeah. And he was a rabbi too. So, um, uh, and plus, the, what, the, what happened to him sounds like <laughs> to a lot of rabbis, thank God, not as severe. So, so uh, Rabbi, this, Rabbi Frank's father was also a rabbi, along with Rabbi Barry's father, Rabbi Sam. And he was also a, a beautiful artist of the stained glass that's behind Rabbi Frank. Thank you. So you want to tell you. a little bit about that stained glass, maybe? You know, because I know we're looking at it and it's so beautiful. Okay, sure. My, my dad being an, an artist, he, he, he didn't, I don't know if he actually soldered every piece together. So he hired a glass maker, perhaps, or a stained glass maker. But he did create the design and he created the, the uh, actual, you know, structure of how he laid out and so on. But, um, you know, he's, he's got countless other pictures all around our house here that he's painted more with religious undertones. And sometimes he would actually bring the picture out to the pulpit and uh, explain his sermon through the actual artwork. Uh, so, it, but the main thing with my dad and with Barry's dad, Sam, they were very uh, outspoken, particularly at a time such as this. I know they would be very upset what's going on right now. But, you know, in, in terms of the legal aspects, I know Barry is out protesting and speaking on the radio and has really important, you know, messages to give to, to um, society, humanity. But, you know, let me ask you this. I just want, I want to bring this up about, it's, it's not necessarily about the abortion issue, but at one point, Barry and I were talking, this is maybe months ago before this even happened about when life begins. So, you know, there's a, uh, is an expression, you know, when does life begin? You know, the rabbi and the priest are arguing, when does life begin? And the, the priest says at the moment of conception and the minister says, no, the, uh, life begins, uh, you know, when, when the baby is born. 
So um, they're arguing back and forth, back and forth. Let's ask the rabbi. Rabbi, tell us, when does life really begin? He says, you know, life really begins when the youngest in the house gets married and the dog dies. That's when life really begins. Yeah. So it was a way to get out of that conversation. But in either case, as Jewish people generally, people from the Torah and people from our, our Talmud and commentaries, we believe, as we do now, even in, in, it makes reality sense, but it's not necessarily I'm speaking politically at all. But uh, they believe and we can see that the last thing that one does in their life is take their last breath. That's when that last breath of air leaves the body. And that's when they formally are pronounced dead, or they could say brain dead or whatever. But the point is that the last breath of air. On the other hand, our ancestors believe, you know, they didn't have x-rays and, and, you know, all the different types of ways to see inside the body. So they would say, you know, God willing, when a baby is born and takes his first breath of air, that's when it would really be an entity, a human being, because sometimes there were stillborns or there were uh, problems with the child that they maybe they did the child couldn't live any more than uh, whatever the point is though that i think that's becoming a point of of conversation that life begins when the baby is born and that on one hand it really turns off many people whether you're full pro-life or, or pro-choice to know that on one hand the baby could be terminated before it comes out of the womb. And I, I don't know, that's not gonna sit well with me per se, not because I'm pro-life or, 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 or pro this or whatever. It just, it's just very strange to know that that can happen. So I think there should be some type of a time frame as to when there could be, if any time frame in your belief, uh, when the baby could be, or the child or the fetus could be terminated. What's your feeling about this? Because I know Barry is on the radio and talking about that really uh, it's up to the woman to decide up until the day of the birth of the, well, not necessarily he's saying that specifically, but that's what it implies, the day of birth of the child. How do you all feel about that? I just want to get some opinions. Yes, go ahead. It's up to the woman. It's her body. Well, it's her decision. But like, is that up until the last day of the uh, delivery? Whatever it is, it's up to the woman. I know, but let's just say legally speaking, not that Barry or whatever we're talking this aspect of it, but what would happen if a baby is, is born and then they decide not to keep the baby and who's going to determine whether it was, God forbid, put to death after it was came out of the womb or God forbid was born, you know, stillborn or terminated, you know, a day beforehand. And that could be like a murder charge or something. I guess it's a frame court. I don't know if the Supreme Court could put a day on it, though. Could they put a day? It's a you know certain uh, two days before birth, or it should it be fifteen weeks? Should it be? I'm just throwing it out to you. Let's discuss this in the sense of what would be, you know, favorable, not necessarily to everybody, but at least less favorable or more favorable to others who are say pro-lifers who think that that should go all the way to, to full term and the baby is born versus you know um, you know people who decide what they want to do with their bodies. Yeah, Rabbi, I think that the, uh, you know, late, the third term abortion or third, yeah, it do doesn't happen. I mean, it's almost never happens. And what Roe versus Wade did was say that the states could not outlaw abortion before the fetus was viable. They didn't say it, it, uh, abortion is legal forever. Um, so it's very, very rare that there's an abortion. And, you know, you already know they've got a severe disease. You already know that the mother is suffering and they're not going to be able to, to take the child to term. So, you know, um, basically, I, I don't remember what what year, what year, what month that ended in or what time. But, you know, generally a fetus isn't uh, viable before about 25, 27 weeks. Um, and I think what happened was, unfortunately, uh, when states started to see this coming and started outlawing abortion, many of the more liberal states went the other direction and say, OK, well, you can have an abortion up until the day the baby's born. That's not really what's supposed to happen. But when we have draconian, no, you can't ever have an abortion, then they're making rules. That, yes, you can have an abortion up until the time of birth. Uh, I, I don't think that that's going to happen. Um, it never has been the rule. It's been very, very rare. I want to say maybe uh, half a percentage point, you know, in the, in the third trimester. So it, it's very, very rare. 
Um, and Roe versus Wade really didn't have anything to do with that anyway. Uh, what yeah. it did was mm-hmm. make it where they couldn't make it where you could you couldn't have an abortion at 15 weeks, um, right. which the, the fetus right. isn't viable anyway at that point in time. Right. So right. you know it doesn't make any difference. Well, you know, generally speaking, I'm not obviously involved in legal aspects of it. I know each state has their own ways of changing or adding and, and states' rights, so to speak. But generally speaking, you know, um, I, I think that there really should be some type of a, of a, a, a limit. Uh, and I don't think Roe versus Wade ever came up with it. Did it come up? Was it a limit or anything like that that said it could be one way or the other, longer or shorter? Was yeah, I don't remember if there was an actual number or not, but it, the, yeah, the, the gist of so. it was that the states could not outlaw it before the child was viable. Right. And that right. would be right. generally 25 weeks or so. So in other words, if 15 weeks right now, you, you, if you have an abortion at 15 weeks, the child is not viable. If you if the child was born, it would not it would not survive. Um, and let me ask you my know. congregation, don't you think that basically this isn't really about Roe versus Wade per se and about abortion? Is it more like states' rights versus federal? The federal government, you know, should not control what we do. Let each state decide what they want to do accordingly. Personally, I don't abortion. think that I don't I think government shouldn't have anything to do with a woman. I mean, it's a woman's right and her family to make that decision. And I don't think government has any jurisdiction. No, I am. I totally understand that. But what happens if something did happen to say a baby was born? I mean, some people are being charged for murder and manslaughter or whatever it is when the baby, when, when something like that happens. So what, I mean, it's a legal thing too. It's not just about it's a moment's choice because there are certain laws that would say, hey, you know what? Uh, you, you just killed the baby. You let the baby die. It was born and, or whatever. You, you didn't take care of it. I'm just saying, this is, these things come up particularly for people who... Um, uh, the, the pro-life people, there's really nothing wrong, in my opinion, about being pro-life. We're all pro-life. What it is is when, when they want to put their uh, beliefs on you or me or whatever, not how we should live our life. So the concept is not a bad concept, pro-life. Right. Well, the Torah, you know, talks about the, the two people that uh, have a fight. And the woman gets hit and the woman miscarries and what happens. So, you know, it's pretty, I think the lawsuit, of course, is that they are presenting their rights um, on to us because they're saying that that's is what I asked the rabbi last week, um, that life begins at conception. Um, right. And that is a Christian belief. That is not a Jewish belief. That is not a Muslim belief. Um, and where did so, Christian belief come from? It came from the Torah. No, no. Um, I mean, it doesn't. I, I, you can, I, I don't know if you can show us the spot where it does, but you know, um, he, uh, Adam becomes a living being when he takes his first breath. Um, right. and it's very interesting that, uh, uh, neonates have to breathe through their nose and guess where God put the air in. When he when he created Adam, he put it into his nostrils, not through his mouth. It's a very interesting medical tidbit. Um, right. But there is there is nothing in the you know what they're saying is yes, they're getting it from Thou shalt not murder. But they're saying it's murder because they believe that life begins at conception, and there is no Torah concept equal to that. Otherwise, the rabbi well, would not be suing them because there would be no lawsuit. Oh, I know. I what well, so I'm saying that they're saying, and the Jewish people believe that the baby became an entity at the first breath of air rather than a conception because after it could have been stillborn or it could be that maybe two three breaths later it passed away i don't know i'm just saying that that's generally and also uh in the torah where it says god creates um adam man of the earth by taking clay and breathing the very breath of life into this clay and that uh, neshuma, that soul that was breathed into that K, became an entity rather than a golem, that is just a piece of clay. So, and also when the same, while the breath of life is within me, I will worship thee, sovereign of the world and Lord of all souls. Not in reliance upon our own merit, we lay our supplications before you, but trusting on infinite mercy alone. For what are we? What is our life? What our value? What can we say in God's presence? I'm just quoting something in the back of my mind. So our, from the very beginning as a, I was growing up, I always felt that the breath of life was the soul, the neshama, and when the breath of life left the body, it would, then you would die. But by the same token, when the breath of life was breathed into the golem or breathed into the baby, where the baby took the first breath, that's when life began. 
again, that's uh, different thoughts. It doesn't mean that one scientifically has to trust in that concept either, but it's a thought. By the way, I grew up in Washington, D.C., so I had best friends, Republican, Democrat, all types, Army, Navy, and so on. So I, I'm open to all different people's you know, thoughts and beliefs and would never criticize you or anyone for believing how you believe. I would just say it sounds interesting. Maybe, uh, maybe I'll be convinced, maybe not. <laughs> maybe I'll vote one way, maybe not. Okay, who else would like to say some words? I'd love to hear from you all. Valerie, are you there? You're there. there you I know are. you've got something to say. <laughs> Hi, Valerie. What? Well, have you got a hell of a lot to say? I just don't know if you want to hear it. <laughs> yeah. have, you been, have you been listening to all this with sugar ass, as we say? <laughs> I'm, I'm listening sure to enough listening. of it. I've been listening to enough of it. Well, first of all, I'm in total agreement with Sharon. The government doesn't belong in a woman's vagina. Period. End of discussion. That's it. Period. Let's say we have babies. We have all these babies. We have a lot of baby daddies. We have a lot of baby mommies. What about the daddies having a mandatory forcibly forced uh, vasectomy when it's proven that they create a child and they're not supporting that child? Why doesn't the government interfere with that? Because we're supporting those children. You're supporting those children. I'm supporting those children. The government is supporting those children. And the men that make them are not holding their, their cells responsible. So why doesn't the government get involved with that, let's see what happens when the tables are turned and the men have to be sterilized to not make the babies that they're not taking care of because there are a whole hell of a lot of them out there, number one. And they know how to find the fathers because we have DNA testing, very simple. That's my opinion. The other thing that I say when I have somebody come to me and say they're pro-life, pro-life, no abortions, I've said this in many instances, I ask them two questions. Number one, you're a pro-lifer. How many foster children do you have? Or how many children have you adopted? Because there are plenty out there. If you want them to be born and you're protecting them in utero, why the hell aren't you protecting them when they're here? So those are my two issues. That's all I have to say. Very well spoken, yeah. beautiful. I like this You've got my thing. vote. Let's see when <laughs> she was on the other foot and the men have to get their stuff cut. Stop making right. all these babies then we wouldn't have a problem with abortion because the babies that are born then are going to have parents to take care of them. Love them. and why, why is the woman the one that's responsible? Vasectomies are reversible too, aren't they? Not in my world. <laughs> okay. You want to have a vasectomy reversed if it was forced by the courts, then you have to prove that you're going to be taking care of a child and maybe put money in escrow businesses in escrow, you know, if, if you had to have a mandatory vasectomy, then you have to prove if you want to have it reversed, you have to prove that you're going to take care of the child that you're going to produce according to the law, according to the government, according to the court. If you're going to get involved with my reproduction, you know, aspect, then you have to get involved with the man's reproductive aspect and make that a law and put it up to the states. And let's see how fast these men vote for that person. I don't think so. <laughs> okay. Okay. I mean, to put Thank Rabbi you. Barry's slant on it, um, yeah, they, they have all these people that are pro-life and and not meaning what you said, Rabbi Frank, but being pro-life for a baby at conception rather than you know a baby at birth or the first breath, and and they're gung ho about this, yet they're not gung ho about taking AR-15s away from the world, you know, except for in the case of war, you know, they let 15 and 16 and 18 year olds, 20 year olds, you know, go into a store and buy as many guns as they want. Um, sure, I had, some say, you know, that the, most, most of the people who are quote unquote pro-lifers are in favor of the death penalty. Oh, I definitely am because you have too many wackos who are really <laughs> criminals have committed mass murder and they're being let out. I mean, how come when, when a person kills one person, two people, 10 people, they're put on trial as mass murderers. And then you have somebody like Putin that kills thousands and thousands and thousands of people. How come he's not putting, being put on trial as a mass murderer? What's the, you know, I, I don't understand that concept either. It's okay to kill millions, but it's not okay 
to kill one and you can have a lawyer defending you. That's, I mean, this, to me, we're living in bizarro world. That's what I'm saying. That Tom Moses got so upset. We're in that same mode right now. Little things start to bother me a little more so than ever before. And I yeah. take well, it to we, heart. We have to be careful about the conversation because it's very easy to, to wrap all of these horrible issues into one big ball, but they're really not. You have to compartmentalize them and, and approach them one issue at a time. I'm a total in agreement with Sharon. I don't believe in you know military grade weaponry and bump stocks and all that being in the hands of civilians. It doesn't belong there. I have grandchildren and grown grandchildren who hunt. None of them use automatic weaponry when they hunt. I mean, there's just no reason for it. So I know I understand. Uh -oh. that. There you go. You're a hunter. Oh my goodness. I'm not a hunter. My grandkids are hunter. I I'm don't approve saying. of it. But, but I'm what, I'm, but I'm, what, what I'm trying to say is that you can put everything in one pot, but it, it can't be in one sure. pot. You have to handle sure. one issue at a time. You know, because they're so they're so different. In this particular mm -hmm. case, when it comes to the abortion issue, I mean that's really, and as far as I'm concerned, that's interfering with religious rights. And, and usually, politically speaking, politicians avoid anything that smacks a political controversy like a third rail. So I'm not understanding just this whole situation where it's going and how it got there. You know, because there's way, too much religious right aspect. Yeah. He doesn't want to go on camera, but he wants to say, you want to say something? Yeah, I just have a, a general opinion. This is coming from a 23-year-old. And I've been hearing this issue throughout my life, you know, throughout, you know, elementary school, middle school, high school, you know, all, you know, extremists on the left, on the right, here and there, whatever. But, you know, we're all smart individuals. We, we know almost every single aspect of our human biology, but we can now determine whether or not that entity that is inside your body is either now receiving stimuli. So if we now determine the exact time, which is not going to be exact for every individual, of course, but if there is an exact time or a range of time where that fetus can read out external stimuli, like the touch of, uh, you know, the stomach or just being able to react, I think that's when life is, and that's my general opinion, but I think there should be a term of where there is a time frame. That's my general opinion. What would that time frame be? How many weeks? That you? time where if that fetus is able to discern a, what, what a stimuli. People know what that might be. 15 they have to do the proper time. science and determine that. It's most likely, you know, they have to six at like least maybe. Rules, that would yes. maybe be it. Mm -hmm. What would it be? 15? What are you? It, I, look, if, uh, if it had to be a time frame, I'm not saying that we agree with that or not agree, right. but if it had to be a time frame, what would that be? Just. Sharon, as a woman, as a, and looking at Gilda, Golda, Gloria, what would that time frame be if there is a time frame? I see what your son is saying. Um, I believe that birth, birth is when, you know, when you take your first breath, that's when the, the fetus is alive. Yet if I was a mother carrying a child for nine months, um, which I was, um, I would feel that that child was alive within me, especially when it would move and kick and, you know, yeah. twist around mm -hmm. and all that. And I think that's what your son's saying. When they get to that point where they're moving and they're, they're, they're pushing their feet against you or they're moving their little hands or they're, you know, they're, they're sucking or whatever, you know, that that could be a time. I don't know how many weeks that is. I don't know if that's 25 or 26, like what Dr. Brooks might mention. Um, but it could be different for a different each different woman. But of course. Um, well, you know, it's interesting you said that now that I understand as a woman, you feel but not you, but one a woman probably knows after wanting to be pregnant, after wanting even not even wanting to be pregnant, but that they are pregnant and they feel the baby moving and so on, that they know, I'm sure you felt that way, that I have a living creature inside me, a living being inside of me. And so other people who've had that experience with the, taking the term to the full pregnancy, and they hear about a woman wanting to have, say, an abortion at a certain time frame, they say, well, that's the same time I started feeling my baby kicking in my stomach. It kind of like makes them feel, you know, that you're taking away a life, even though, again, the other person might not feel as much. But as a woman, you have a lot more of a, of a uh, feeling toward that. Yes. One, one yeah. other thing, this is a little bit of a, 
a morbid example per se. If someone were to commit murder on a woman who was pregnant, they will get charged with double, double homicide rather than just homicide of the mother. They will get charged with double homicide because they killed a baby as well. And if, let's say, there's late-term abortion available, you know, why that, that person who murdered those, the mother and the baby could get off with just getting murder for the mother, essentially. I'm just a morbid example, but... <laughs> I think that well, I think that once again depends on the age of the fetus. I don't think that's necessarily true. If you're six weeks pregnant and you kill and a woman is killed, I don't necessarily think that that she's charged with double murder. But perhaps when she's 26 weeks pregnant and the baby could live outside of the womb, um, then then I know you are. And I don't know the exact time, so I, I'm not I'm not arguing with your premise. I'm just saying I don't think it's necessarily true for the younger ages. And I guess, you know, even if they can feel something, if they can't survive without being in the mother, then then how is that life? That's that's a good you point know? too, Mike. I mean, if I've got a if I've got a tumor in my in my liver, it's probable that if you stick a needle in it, it's gonna hurt. Um me you know because you did it but it's got sensation so is is sensation necessarily life you know all these concepts that you know what we're talking about today are, are things that I'm, I'm relating back to tour reading this is what moses faced all the issues and you know obviously different at that time and so it kind of puts all of us at, at you know uh, on edge so how do you feel that do you think because we're on edge that we have then the um the right, so to speak, or can we be forgiven more easily that we struck the rock twice or that we maybe did something slanderous to someone or whatever, or cussed at someone or yelled at someone or hit someone? Should we be a little more uh, compassionate toward that feeling now or still keep the same? Well, Just, you know, getting, al getting, along, getting along in that, on that vein, mm -hmm. let's say, you know, the abortions are banned, okay? And we know abortions are going to not stop just because they're banned. Women are going to find ways to do it, and they're going to be unhealthy, and many, many women are going to die. So let me put the shoe on the other foot. Can the family of a woman who has to have an abortion for whatever the reason, has to have it, and she, is, she dies as a result of that botched abortion, whether it's an infection or it's a botched abortion, does the family now have a right to sue the state for killing that woman, for not allowing her to, to, to have a medically approved safe procedure? Can the family or friend or relative of that woman sue the state for murder? Because as far as I'm concerned, that's what the states are condoning. You're not going to stop abortion I don't care what the hell you do. You are not going to stop it. You're going to put it back in the dark ages of the back alleys. And my question is, would I, God forbid, know somebody, have a family member that is, suffers and dies as a result of that? Do I have a right to sue that state for killing that woman? Because I think I would. And I would damn well move forward on that and see what happens. What is your opinion on that? I uh... I, I definitely do um, agree with that, but um, I, I do think that um, here you can go ahead. I'm, I'm no, glad you feel that way. I have another point. Go ahead. Oh, okay, he just agree. he agrees with you. Any other thoughts? So, I mean, going back to our Torah reading, how do you feel? Are we are we on the edge? Is this helping us to cope more by? Uh, having these issues come up that takes us away from the thinking of like inflation or the high gas prices or, or, or vice versa. What do you think? I mean, what's happening to all of us, in, you know, in reality, in our lives, are we better off now? Or, you know, I'm, I'm just throwing it out to you. I'll get some ideas. I haven't heard her. I haven't heard anybody respond to what I just said, because as far as I'm concerned, what I just said has a lot of validity. Oh, I don't know we, we, we agree with you. We agree with you. We oh, agree. yeah, definitely agreed. Whether that's, agreed. Whether that's but, people actually take place on that level, I don't know. It would be interesting. It would be an interesting lawsuit to see, you know, if somebody did so. But in reality, the person that's going to get sued is a doctor that, that did it. Right. Um, right. And, and, the, and the child and the, 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 the mother did. not And that's, that's where the responsibility is going to be. You know, and, we and did, are they taking care of the babies, you know? Unfortunately, one of the parties is not real interested in food stamps and WIC um, and that type of stuff. So they're not real interested in taking care of 
the baby after they're born. So they're really not pro-life, they're anti-abortion. Um, and there's a big difference there, you know, but, uh, but I, I would like to see what happened with the lawsuit. But I guess my question to your, to my answer to your question is, so are we saying that we need to be easier on ourselves than God was on Moses? And how does that work? In other words, do we forgive ourselves for being a little on edge and hitting the rock twice when Moses didn't get forgiven for that? Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a good point. It's that way with uh, a lot of things in politics, you know, where, you know, if you don't agree with the way I'm saying and someone else says something differently, it's like, it's like you're totally wrong and you, you were brainwashed and or whatever words they can come up with to, to make you feel like an inhumane type person, then I, I don't think it's right. We're here to discuss things. Like I said, I grew up in Washington, D.C. My best friend's a Republican, Democrat. My best friend turned out to be uh, president of the United States, his father. And uh, we were, at the time, liberal Democrats. And these Republicans, a little more conservative. They lived in a segregationist neighborhood. You know, and, but we all still cared for each other and didn't really draw conclusions on every little detail of what every person said. It was a lot more than just one topic. There's a many, many topics. And, and we're having dinner with uh, the Republican and we're having dinner with the Democrats. And I would have, you know, so it's, it's a lot of things that they did agree on, too. So anyway, something just to think about. That's how I grew up. That's why I kind of like speak objectively in, most of the time. In my opinion, I think the very big issue in our society currently is extremism, whether it be one way or the other. It's just the the you know absolute fact it's this or no other way and there's no in between there's no agreement of, between people there should be an agreement between everyone in our society by the way uh growing up in washington dc my dad uh being uh one of the founding well not a founding but he's the 10,000th member of the naacp and the president of the naacp at the time was a white jewish male kibby kaplan and uh one night a man came to our house for shabbat dinner he was a tall black man, and I didn't know this because I happened maybe when I was seven or eight or maybe younger. And I said to this tall black man who happened to be Thurgood Marshall, I said this tall black man, I said, sir, are you Jewish? And I only reason why I know I said that because my mother just told me this recently. And she said, you know what he said after you asked, are you Jewish? And I said, I said, no, mom, I have no idea. He looked down to me and he says, son, I have enough problems as it is. So I thought that was very insightful to see that there's so many more issues than just one little speck of an issue. And that shouldn't really be determining, you know, how we believe or, or not believe or who we support or don't support because of one little issue. So that's my personal feeling or personality. But again, we're all entitled to do what we think is appropriate. So let's hear from others. Let's hear it's what's going on out there. I can't hear anybody. Who else Hello? would like to share? Alan, you want to say anything? Or Gloria? Harris, you want to chip in, well, chime in? Uh, well, uh, I understand that uh, Joe Biden has a 70% uh, uh, disapproval rating. So, uh, I, you know, that's that makes sense to me. But I guess with all the things going on in this country uh, where we have uh, in my life, well, in, in the last, what, 40 years, never had problems like we're having today. And yeah. uh, so I said, all these problems are piling up on Joe Biden, and there isn't much he can do about it. Maybe he has to strike the rock twice. He's the scapegoat. Maybe he has right. to strike the rock twice like Moses. Was Moses a scapegoat and uh, to, you know, not be allowed to go into the promised land? Or was it just yeah. coincidental or? I don't know. Um, just thoughts to, to put out. Is there any, any question, anything else in particular you want to talk about besides now this tour reading again, it's, it's just, it's, it's really appropriate for the sign of times right now of how things are on edge. And I just, know that being the difference between an animal and a human being is that an animal just jumps out real quick and could bite you or not even have a consciousness about it. Whereas a human being has a more of a conscious, we can say, look, I, I want to strike this person. I want to do this, but I'm going to hold back because I have some humanity and I have a belief in God or a belief in, you know, consciousness. So, um, 
So maybe uh, Moses had 100% faith in God uh, along the way, or maybe a lot less. And at that one moment, you know, after people are complaining and breathing down his back, you know, for every little detail, maybe he just lost it. And uh, that's what's going on right now. Maybe some, I'm not saying it's the same level, of course, but some of these people that are doing things, driving cars into people and then doing the shooting and maybe they just can't take anymore. The society has gotten too much of a uh, tumult. I mean, something to think about. Rabbi this Frank, yes. the part yes. about the red heifer, What what is the yes. point of the red, red heifer? Well, Why you know, did he that, want no. them to find that? Well, because, you know, it's a good question. I don't know that. Maybe the, the pastor knows. I don't know. It, it, my my reading of this doesn't um, didn't didn't cover that. So I don't know. I'm just thinking there's something else here, too, that um, here instruct the Israelite people to bring you a red cow without blemish. In which there is no defect and on which no yoke has been laid. You shall give it to Eliezer, the priest. It shall be taken outside the camp and slaughtered in his presence. So, so you know, it's, so it was strictly uh, it's, for it's, a it's, sacrifice. So it was a, a special yeah. sacrifice, a pure, though. A pure sacrifice. In other words, back in those days, sacrifices at different levels and in, 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 in different fines were created. It wasn't a money fine. It was more like, you know, if, if it was a, it's a minor offense, you bring some food to the Kohanim or you bring something of the Kohanim, an offering. And if it's more and more and more, you have like a slaughtering of a of a one type of an animal versus another type of an animal. And apparently the one without blemish was the highest level of a of a, if you will, a fine to pay uh, for our sins, so to speak. That's my my quick take. What do you think, Pastor, being that you are uh, knowledgeable in Torah and the Bible and so on? Is that me, Rabbi? Yeah. See, how you doing? Is that okay. you? Okay. What? Yeah, no, I'm I'm actually a medical doctor, um, so oh, that's good. my doctor, and I'm Jewish. So oh, good. Um, so yeah, so I I, um, I wasn't sure if I was the pastor that you referred to or not, but maybe <laughs> no, I said something who, early who, on. That, on. Who introduced you as a pastor? Someone did not at the beginning. No, did someone the, introduce a pastor? No, oh, no, my, that, my, Dr. Oh, my, my confusion. Oh, so doctor, so you're a medical doctor and you're Jewish, obviously, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I don't know if you saw my joke, but I'd always heard that a, a, a child is uh, considered viable when they graduate from medical school. That, oh, that's in the chat. Too, yeah. So, yeah. That, so, that's yeah. A, that's a good so. one, too. And, um, <laughs> hey, so, hey, Mr. Schwartz, no. your, your husband, Mr. Schwartz, your son's being sworn in as president of the United States, the first Jewish president. Oh, forget about him. My other son is a doctor. That's right. He's a doctor. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. No doubt. But uh, I find it interesting in that in that particular ceremony that one, I think that what is the what is the name for something that uh, law that doesn't make any sense? Hukat or Hukot or Hukah or something. Well, anyway, the there's a word tonight. for it. That's, oh, that's the Torah know, reading for, for tonight. Hukat. Right. Right. OK. But there's also a, 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 a terminology yeah. that's something similar to that for for commandments that don't make any sense whatsoever. Um, and I think, what's it called? <laughs> Meshuggah. Oh, <laughs> that too. Yes, ma'am. Um, I know. Barry, but anyway, I know Barry would have that answer. Rabbi Barry would definitely have that answer. Yeah, so but it is interesting that the person that when he when he puts the the water on the person, that person becomes clean, and the priest actually becomes unclean. It's kind of a strange, oh. kind of a strange situation. And then I guess they go be become clean and i guess that's the question for when messiah comes is uh since it's got to be done on the first and the eighth day um how are any of us going to be able to to go up the temple mount and i think that's the big thing that you know the 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 israeli government has forbidden it uh well in addition to not starting world war three but uh um that we can't prove ourselves clean i mean i come in contact with dead bodies or a cemetery or whatever at least on a weekly basis uh, thankfully, I'm not a, a priest, but still, I would not be allowed into the third temple uh, because I'm not a claim and I can't do this ritual that we're talking about this week. Um, so that's going to be one of the decisions the Messiah is going to have to make is, well, how do I rectify all of that? And we'll see. Doctor, you know, I didn't realize it was you because the light's on you, but you have a picture of not rather than a video of you. That's why right, exactly. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Oh, no wonder. Now I understand. <laughs> okay. Your lips are muted. Uh, so, you know, I am a Kohen, 
Uh, and as you know, the strict Kohanim you know, aren't allowed to marry a woman who's uh, divorced or, you know, they can only marry someone who's a widow or someone never married before and not allowed to walk into the grounds of the cemetery uh, and so on, be around, um, you know, unclean things. So I'm a Kohanim, but I do countless funerals every year. And but I I don't really feel that I'm disrespecting, you know, the reform type uh, attitude of Kohanim uh, or even some of the conservative. But I know for sure I am disrespecting the orthodox point of view of Kohanim. So but again, I'm not the many different aspects of Judaism. That's why you say Jewish, you know, five ish. You know, so uh, <laughs> right. I believe, I believe very good that. point. Still, and I would say yeah. I agree with you 100 percent. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, uh, you know, I mean, just I've been around people who who do that profession too. I mean, let's just say, for example, you're oh, let's say you're around a uh, God forbid a, a mortician is just just been with the body and so on, and then you know you're closer to that than than the actual body in a sense. Who knows? Just different thoughts. So um, I just make sure that I keep myself uh, clean and uh, pure with thoughts. And I can give a Kohenim prayer to everyone before you leave. I'm not sure what time it is, but I can say, here's the Absol Kohenim prayer. Absolutely. I was going to ask you for that. <laughs> sure. We'll still go on after this. May God bless you and keep watch over you. May God's presence shine upon you and be gracious to you. Amen. And may God watch over this blessed, beautiful congregation of Ador Vador for all those zooming in and grant everyone around the world shalom, peace in Israel, peace in the Middle East, peace in the Ukraine, peace in our homes, peace in our hearts. And may we go forth in our lives with shalom, with peace. And let us say amen. Amen. And amen. so it shall be. Amen. Amen. It's just that was words, beautiful, right? Rabbi. That was words. beautiful. But, you know, when you think about it, that comes straight from the Torah. They didn't ask for money, prosperity. They didn't ask for health. They didn't even ask for happiness. They didn't ask for anything other than one thing, shalom. Because when you have shalom, then everything is a corpusator. Everything's in perfect order. You could be deathly ill. Which, and you is, have peace which is what heart. shalom, one of its meanings is perfect order, right? Perfect order. And Kohanim says shalom. That's a shin. And then there's two shins, and then my head and arms is a three shin, if you can see in the camera enough. <laughs> okay, there you go. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it's on every mezuzah, the shin. Yeah. So let's hear some from you all, my dear friends. Let's hear some more. Any questions about something else that has nothing to do with Dukat? Because everything has to do with Dukat. We're all going through these crazy times now. Well, I think this, this is something very interesting if you go back historically. His, now, this is just in general. The, the New Testament was actually put together by Constantine and the Holy Roman Empire to try to consolidate power. They took the whole Michigan, the Megillah, if you will. And, you know, in that ancient time, women were very, very powerful. They were the soothsayers. They were the, the midwives. They were very, women had a very powerful part in society. And when Constantine and the, the, his tribunal put together the, the books to create the quote unquote New Testament, it eliminated a lot of and took it usurped a lot of the power from women in the society at that time because he wanted to consolidate power. Now, here we are in the 21st century. And once again, we have women now being judges, being doctors, being politicians, making policy. And now suddenly we have this whole control situation by the states and men to control women's bodies. Do you find an ironic correlation there? Because if you think about it, I'm kind of reflecting on that every day. And I'm saying, wow, are you, if you're a student of history, we're having another mm -hmm. Constantine day. And when, you know, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found and the entire story started to be put together, you saw how much Constantine and his tribunal eliminated from the actual true story of the, the Bible. Let me ask you, let me ask you, do you, I just, just asking, just throwing this out. I'm not espousing any belief for me, but do you think that really that some politicians want to control a woman's body or just. No, I don't think that. 
How can you think that with what's going on? You have to be yeah. absolutely ob ob oblivious if you no, don't no, but, think but, but that. They, and conversely, <laughs> they, they not, well, don't want to control your bodies, but why not you use your own mind, women or whoever, men or whatever, and, and, and control your bodies rather than having a state come in or someone come in to do something when supposedly, I'm just speaking out loud, that one doesn't have the insight as to what they may be doing to a human being. I'm, uh, not, listen, I'm that. not arguing that point with you at all because I'm in, I'm in full agreement with you. You have to be responsible for your own actions. Unfortunately, that's not the case. And when you have an irresponsible person, it doesn't just affect that person. It affects society. It affects their family. It affects you. It affects me because we are paying the price for that stupidity, if you will, or that lack of control or that lack of education, you know, and that is an issue. And I'm not negating that but by any stretch of the imagination. Okay. You know, so, you know, it's a, it's a multi, multi-level, multi-tiered situation that we're dealing with, you know, and I, I don't take it lightly at all. I, I, have to I think it has to do with also with, like, I think this gentleman was saying, the doctor was saying, you know, it has to do with the Who's going to be held responsible one way or the other? How about other? the men who made the babies, like I was saying before? I know that, you can't do I'm it by yourself. <laughs> I know How come they're that. not paying a price? <laughs> no, I, I why don't? Right. Why are they not paying a price, Rabbi? Why are they not being, you know, I, why do not they have a price? If it's their yeah, child and they're not being responsible, cut it off. <laughs> Let's figure out how to do that. I agree with you. Let's figure out how to do it. But for right now, we're at the mode where you know, women could be terminating a pregnancy and there's a certain law. A doctor might be involved and they, they might get in trouble or they get charged. I mean, it's a very mm -hmm. fearful time. You know what is. Do. You go, we can go around in circles in this for, for, for forever. Yeah. You know, we, we really can. And it's a very, very serious issue. But I think the that, point I think of the matter is, is, is that the other woman and the doctor should be responsible for that situation. Yeah, but what happens if, not, they, if the, the government come down or somebody's come down saying it's a doctor who made who made the decision who based upon the woman's decision and you know doctor you you could be in a lot of God forbid a lot of trouble for doing something because who knows even if you make one mistake on a proper bear uh, proper pregnancy you could be sued. It's called medical yeah. insurance and <laughs> you know, we oh, you can, I had somebody put my lawn down if I don't like what it looks I'm gonna sue them for that. I mean, come on, anybody can sue anybody for any reason, for anything at any time. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. just the way this country is, 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 you know, but I understand from an emotional point of view, from a physical point of view, from a religious point of view, from an educating point of view, from a lack of responsibility point of view. I mean, there's so many, there's so many overlying issues to this situation and it, it is a tough one. It definitely is, but interfering medically with, between a woman and her doctor, no matter what the situation is, in my opinion, is out of line for the states to interfere. You already said that already, but what about the doctor who goes along with that woman and he gets in trouble for it? It's not about making a decision, men and the doctor. And the woman. It's, it's also the legal, decision. too. The doctor's not carrying that child. Yeah. So the doctor's not the carrying woman. that child. The woman is. So let me ask you, based upon our Torah reading today, Sidra Hukat means the laws, which is very appropriate to speak about. In your opinion... So are we going to be forgiving a Moses to have struck the rock twice? But at least the water came through. He got the job done, so to speak. Are we going to be forgiving of others for striking the rock twice, so to speak? Well, here if you go again. We're back to the Bible. Uh, where does life begin? If, if, if there's no rock to strike, then there's no problem. If life, if, if there's no life, then there's no problem. If you don't believe, if you believe life begins at birth, then there is no problem. There is no rock. That's my so whole point. In general, other things that, that we're going through right now in society, <laughs> in addition to the this issue. Anyway, well, that's so, what I'm saying. You can't put everything in the same bucket. bucket. You have to yeah. have to test in one situation okay. at a time. You can't put it all in one bucket because they're different issues. They're different philo philosophical, religious, and political issues. They're all separate issues. Gun control. They're all separate issues, and they have to be addressed separately according to their own merits or lack thereof. 
That's my opinion. So let me ask you, so on every issue, so if it turns out that that one group or one person thinks it should be one way and you or me might say it should be a different way, does that mean that we are completely right and they're completely wrong? It doesn't mean that. No, you follow I mean, your saying, conscience. You do what you feel is right and you have somebody else do what they feel is right. And right, if there is exactly. no life, and religiously, if life doesn't begin till they take the first breath, then they're not breaking any religious laws. Okay. So therefore, religion has nothing to do with it. Then it's, it's just a state interfering. <laughs> oh, do we That's forgive Moses? Do we forgive layers. him and let, let it go on? Let's, let's in our minds forgive Moses, forgive you, forgive me, our beliefs one way or the other. We all think we're all trying to do the best we can with what we have to to pro, uh, pro to progressively you know, live in this earth and make it inhabitable for others. You know, like, you know, for example, what, what does bother me a little bit in particular is that we have all these wonderful rules and regulations of what goes on in this country with pollution and with this and that. And you go to some other country and they're just totally obliterating, you know, the environment. And here we are a little, well, not that small of a country, but a little small microcosm. And they're taking advantage of our tight rules. And then they're out there producing, you know, all kinds of environmentally, you know, bad things for the, now we're for the world. we're talking about pollution, okay. <laughs> No, you know, I'm just saying, we're just different thoughts that big people have. We, you know, whatever. Okay. No, I, I hear what you're saying. Look, I was a guardian ad litem in the 11th Judicial District. I advocated it's for abuse, neglect, and abandoned children. I saw what went on firsthand because I was in court advocating for these children. And so that's why Beautiful. I have such a strong opinion of what's going on. Okay. Once these I children think it's are a here, noble, where is noble this voluntary is profession. That's a very noble voluntary profession being a guardian ad litem. Beautiful. God and I you. saw hell. I saw hell for these children. And I don't want these children living in hell. And that's what's going to happen when they're forced to be born and they're not wanted. I saw it. I but took care of, people, of it. I some of these children like that, are, some of these children like that are born legitimately. Both parents want the child and all of a sudden things happen. So it's like the same thing happens even with a beautiful uh, pregnancy and birth. Okay. All right. Well, I think we've... Um... Beat this to a dead horse to death. <laughs> um, I'd like to invite you all to Shabbat in person at the Mariposa, 9130 Hypoluxo Road in Lake Worth, Western Boynton Beach, Lake Worth, um, on Friday evening at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. It'll also be available virtually through our YouTube and Zoom.